All right. Uh, the sin of sodomy. The sin of sodomy. Um, can someone read for us 1 Corinthians 6 on your sheet to open us? Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? But do, but, excuse me, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such we, such were some of you. But you were washed, but you are sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Amen. Amen. That is our opening passage, um, and we will address it further a little bit later on. Uh, just as introduction to see how some of all these things fit together, I just learned uh, this past week that Norway uh, outlawed hate speech against, uh, particularly against transgendered people, and they did so, they're outlawing hate speech not only in public, but in private. <coughs> so in private. And you know, hate speech isn't necessarily how we would define hate as Christians, <laughs> speaking, of, speaking the truth uh, into that situation. Uh, so if someone reports you for private remarks, you can face a fine or up to a year in jail. Public remarks up to three years in jail. So, these subjects have very practical applications, very practical outworkings. Uh, you see hate speech laws in Canada now, and you see them being proposed in different parts of the United States. So it's pretty dangerous stuff. So that's just one example of why, they think, why these things matter. Uh, also, the use of the term, before we begin, the use of the term sodomy. Um, that was the old term, the older term. And it's good to realize that the term primarily changed for this reason, uh, because there was a worldview shift. So so if, you, if you say the word sodomy or sodomite, you're emphasizing that there is an evil action taking place. There is an act. There is an act of sodomizing someone else. And it's evil. The use of the term homosexuality emphasizes the new ideology, which is that this is basically same-sex desires are not a matter of moral choices, but natural disposition. So that's really the meaning, that is really why the, the term changed. And that's one of the reasons, we'll get into it more later, but that's one of the reasons you might cringe when you hear the word sodomy. Because it's not used very often anymore because the worldview shifted. Um, so we'll talk more about why you may cringe at the word, um, but I used it for that reason. I, I used it, it might make sense a little bit later on, but I used it to make you cringe. And, and I'll explain, if you do cringe, why you may cringe at the term, when it was, it was, it was always the term. All right. Is gay the new black is one way to title this next section, or... The normalization, the normalization of homosexuality. Now let's go through some stats here real quick. Now, Alfred Kinsey, it's a name you may want to know, Alfred Kinsey, is the one who popularized this one in ten statistic. Has anyone heard of this one in ten statistic? One in ten people are gay. Has anyone heard that? Okay. So that was popularized, not in this bunch, but it was popularized in the culture at large. And it's a complete lie. It's not true whatsoever. Um, Alfred Kinsey, you know, we talked about John Money last week. Alfred Kinsey is another sexual uh, kind of quack um, who, uh, you know, many uh, people on this side of things, uh, on that side of things, uh, love uh, as some quote-unquote scholar. Um, but he, he made up this statistic and it's been popular ever since. And that just reminds us, just in passing, uh, that you can have very smart, you could be a very smart person, have lots of credentials, and lie. You know, media lies, scholars lie, 
academics lie, smart people lie, people lie. So be aware, <laughs> be aware of this. The actual stat, uh, the best that we, we can come up with is from the National Health and Social Life Survey, and it's this, 2.8% of males and 1.4% of females identify themselves as homosexual or bisexual. Pretty small percentage, but significant. Now, here's where things get odd. If you have never heard this before, this might blow your mind. Uh, this, uh, the first time I heard about this is from a, a, a pastor who I brought up a couple weeks ago during a social justice uh, discussion uh, named uh, Vody Balcom. Uh, this is the first time I heard this, uh, first person that made me aware of this. It's very fascinating. There is this book in the 1980s called After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s. It was written by uh, two professors at Harvard, Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madsen. One was a, in psychology and the other in advertising. One in psychology and one in marketing. That's very important to keep in, to keep in mind. Their goal was to use the AIDS crisis to change the way that people thought about homosexuality. That was their goal in this book and their goal in the culture at large. This is how they planned on doing it. There's a, let's look at the quote on your sheet. This is how they planned on doing it. The campaign we outline in After the Ball, though complex, depends centrally upon a program of unabashed propaganda, firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising. Now think about this. If you read that in the 80s, you probably would have thought, no way. That's not going to work. You can't trick the American people into thinking good thoughts about something that's not good. Over time, by propaganda, <laughs> but uh, living today, you know that it did work. It worked completely. Um, like I said, we need to be more suspicious uh, and realize you know, what the psalmist states over and over again. The wicked have their schemes. They're not dumb. You know, they, they scheme. They sit and they scheme. God laughs and he, he'll eventually overthrow them as he does in cyclical patterns. Uh, but they scheme nonetheless. And they get stuff accomplished sometimes. Um, and they got this accomplished. So how do they go about this propaganda campaign? How did this propaganda campaign... How, what was their strategy? Desensitizing, jamming, and then conversion. Desensitizing, jamming, and conversion. And they lay all this out in the book. And Vody Balcom points out, this is actually the three steps of brainwashing. It's the same three steps of brainwashing. It's pretty interesting. But anyway, desensitizing. This is what they say. To desensitize straights to gays and gayness, inundate them in a continuous flood of gay-related advertising, presenting in the least offensive fashion possible. If straights can't shut off the shower, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. So notice how many gay television characters there have been for the past 20, 30 years. And how happy they always are. That's why gay, gay, happy. How happy and joyful they always are. Jamming. So we've got to desensitize them to this, all right? You want to, you know, just flood them with this stuff, then jamming. Accuse religious people. Gays can use talk to muddy the moral waters, that is, to undercut the rationalizations that justify, quote unquote, justify religious bigotry and to jam some of the psychic rewards. In other words, they go on to say, portray anti gay institutions as antiquated backwaters, badly out of step with the times and with the latest findings of psychology. They've done that, haven't they? So basically, you equate anti gay preaching with the KKK. Mm -hmm. And then over time, people may start to believe it. Oh, he hates gay people, just like the other people who hated black people. Mm -hmm. Ah. And then they start to, start to uh, you know, think that gay is the new black. It's the new civil rights uh, issue of our time. And then eventually their, their primary goal was conversion, was conversion. It isn't enough that anti-gay bigots should become confused about us or even indifferent to us. We are safest in the long run if we can actually make them like us. They are not 
simply talking here about a minor political shift in the way someone's thinking. They go on to say, we mean conversion of the average American's emotions, mind, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation via the media and the schools. This is really wild stuff. This is really, really, really wild stuff. But it worked. It all worked. Their plan was basically accomplished, and that is what we are living in today, um, in the conversion period, where it basically has been accomplished. So long story short, this is exactly what happened. Notice, notice, even in the church, we typically don't address this sin as we do other sins. We, we often try to make, to make excuses for God on the matter. Have you ever heard that? How some preachers will speak on this issue? Bodie Balcom gives a very helpful analogy, uh, which I want to dig into your minds. Um, he says, can you imagine a preacher getting up and preaching on adultery, and before they, you know, in their introduction, they say, you know, before I begin, I just want you to know that I have a lot of friends that are adulterers. I love adultery. They mean a lot to me, and I care deeply about adulterers. See, immediately you say, something's off here. Something's off here. We've shifted the way that we discuss this sin. We've bought into the, into the lie that it's different than any other sin. That there's this third category of people, it's sort of like skin color, called gays. And so we should treat them as we, you know, we talk about it in the same way that we talk about racism, you know. But uh, that's just not the biblical story, the biblical message. Uh, this is a sin, as Paul says, effeminate homosexuals will not enter the kingdom of God. But then notice what he goes on to say. He lists other sins as well. And, and notice what he goes on to say. But such were some of you. So Paul doesn't have this once gay, always gay idea, right? He, 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 he also notice, going to my background, he doesn't have this once a drunkard, once a drug addict, always a drug addict mentality. It was, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed by Jesus, by the Spirit. All right, how does the Bible talk about same-sex sins? And did Jesus talk about it? That's important. Did Jesus talk about it? it maybe if you've, if you've uh, heard anything from the gay, quote unquote, gay Christian movement um, over the past decade or so, you may have heard this. Well, Jesus never said anything about it. And we go with Jesus. He never, he never mentioned it. So it's very important to answer how Jesus did speak to the issue. Um, all right. You, you maybe don't know the scholarly works that have been done trying to um, uh, debunk this idea uh, that the Bible speaks against sodomy. Um, there's been lots of work done in the past 20, 30 years to try to overthrow the idea that the Bible is speaking against same-sex, loving, monogamous relationships. Um, and, and there's plenty of different arguments out there. Here, here are some of, of the, this is some of the way they go about it before we dive into the Bible and Jesus and what he said. Dr. Brownson, a liberal scholar, uh, argued that when the Bible is referring to same-sex sex, sex it is referring to temple prostitution solely, not same-sex loving monogamous couple, you know, your friendly neighborhood gay couple down the street. Not talking about that, it's talking about uh, temple, cult, um, sacred, you know, pagan religious prostitution. Uh, not talking about your nice gay couple down the street. Uh, this has been thoroughly debunked, however, many, many times. Um, and so you don't hear much of that argument anymore. The argument's starting to shift to be more radical because they realize all the conservatives came out and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, here's obvious reasons why that doesn't make any sense. Um, now they're shifting to an argument more like this. In the Bible, Dan Obia, listen to this, on, it's on your sheet. In the Bible itself, the revelation of God's word occurs when some person or community within Israel or the church reinterprets past tradition in order to give a new meaning in the present. Revelation occurs as the reinterpretation of tradition. This is how, for example, the Gospels got written. 
If the revelation of God is not to remain fixed in the, excuse me, in the past, the reinterpretation process that produced the Bible must continue in the life of the Christian community. You see, so they say revelation takes place when we, when the modern community, whatever year that is, the modern, the new living community reinterprets the past traditions as they think about them in their modern context. So we need to take the Bible and do the very same thing, continue that tradition, reinterpreting them, re reinterpreting the revelation in light of our modern context and scientific research. Uh, so that's, that's the, you know, much of the modern argument today. So authors would like, they, they, they try to supersede the New Testament's sexual ethic with what they would call an ethic of love. So they take statements in the New Testament on love and they say, the sexual ethic was subject to the time. That was custom. And we know that that's wrong today. But the love remains, because love always remains, right? So we got to supersede the New Testament sexual ethic with the ethic of love, right? And then, therefore, be accepting and affirming of the sin of homosexuality. So some of these arguments will, will even argue, they will even go on to argue that Jesus didn't know what we know today. Jesus didn't have the scientific insights. So right there you can see, you know, these aren't Bible-believing Christians. You know, these are radical liberal scholars that call themselves Christians, dress up in nice robes maybe in their PCUSA um, uh, church houses. But um, they're definitely not Bible believers. All right. The Bible. Let's go to the Bible. Um, go to Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 5. And as you do, let me introduce some of this. But uh, take note that Jesus, here's a shocker, Jesus was a first century Jew. Um, he wasn't a, wasn't a white guy, he wasn't a black He was a Jew. He was a Jew. As Dr. Michael Brown, who wrote a good book on this issue, I, I wouldn't recommend him necessarily for other theological issues, uh, but for this cultural issue, homosexuality, he's done some very good work. Um, so I'll, when I send out the email, I'll send it in one of his books um, as a recommendation uh, on this topic. Uh, but but he, he lays out some arguments uh, to answer how Jesus talked about it. It's very helpful. Um, he, he points out that, you know, um, he's a Jewish Christian scholar. And he points out this, ancient Jewish texts from the last centuries B.C. and the first centuries have some very negative things to say about homosexual practice and not one single positive thing to say. So all of the Jewish texts we have surrounding, historically surrounding the time of Christ, all negative stuff about homosexuality. Not one positive thing, which you would expect. I mean, it seems obvious, but needs to be said. Jesus was a first century Jewish rabbi. That's what he was. He was much more than that. But he was that. Right? All right. So do you really think the first century rabbi was positive about homosexuality? That seems obvious and an indefensible idea to say the opposite. Furthermore, what was the authority of a first century Jew? What was their chief authority? The Torah. Right? The law of God, the Torah. Uh, which Jesus said what about? Ah, let's read. Matthew chapter 5, starting verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So Jesus held to the law of God. He held to the law of God. So right there, it proves the point. Unless Jesus said and abrogated laws against homosexuality in the Torah, he affirms them. You have to assume that from the jump. So right there, the argument, we get to put the argument to bed. That's one way he addressed it. He affirmed what's, what's in it. All right. Although it wasn't a huge point of Jesus' ministry, it, it, it wasn't homosexuality and these subjects, sexuality, wasn't a huge point 
because it was assumed at the time. That's one way you should look at this. It was completely assumed. Every Jew knew that it was sinful. The same way, and I'm not comparing the two things because they're different sins, uh, but they're both sexual sins. In the same way a Jew would assume incest is evil. In the same way a Jew would assume bestiality is evil. In the same way a Jew would assume adultery is evil. They would assume homosexuality is evil. And there's, there's no way around that. There's no way around that. All right. Second, Jesus addressed it in Matthew 15. So you can turn there. We're sticking to the book of Matthew, if you, if you haven't noticed. Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Starting in verse 17. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat what is with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Uh, the term there for sexual immorality is, is pornia, and that's one of the reasons Hebrews, uh, Greek is easier to read uh, and learn than Hebrew because of words like pornia. I mean, you kind of know what that vocab word means, right? Uh, por pornia. Um, so it, it's in the plural here. So what Jesus is saying here is sexual immoralities. It, it, it can be translated in the plural, sexual immoralities. What does that include to a first century Jew? What is he speaking against? Anything that God says is sexual immorality. To a first century Jew, that would mean anything outside of one man, one woman marriage. That would be a sexual immorality. Anything outside of that. Jesus goes farther in Matthew 19, so turn there. Matthew 19, teaching about divorce, starting in verse 1, Matthew 19. He makes this even more clear <laughs> and what he believes about sexuality. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away. He said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And then 10 through 12 is what we read last week about eunuchs. Um, so right there, what does Jesus do? He goes back to the beginning, the creation order, and he affirms... What is found there? From the beginning, God made man and woman. And that is how God defines a marriage, a sexual union. Man, woman, one man, one woman, marriage. That's how it's defined. Therefore, anything outside of that is what he spoke against before. Sexual immoralities, pornia, fornication, adultery, right? So these are the ways, so to, to argue that Jesus didn't speak on this issue, is silly, number one. No, number two, it's just not true, because he spoke of these things in general. And also, it even gets more silly when you realize, did Jesus speak against incest? Well, I guess it's okay then. You know, like, but are you, that's not, you can't make that argument consistently. If, if you want Jesus, to, if Jesus had to say something against it for, it for it to be wrong, he didn't speak on a host of things. And that, that means they're right. Bestiality, incest, etc. Other things that the Torah speaks against that Jesus didn't repeat. That's why it's very important for us to, to understand, and this is one of the good things about being Reformed, is that we really believe there's 66 books of the Bible. We don't ignore the Old Testament. Um, it, and, and we read the Bible as a whole. 
it's not just sola scriptura, the Bible alone is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church, but it's tota scriptura. So all of the Bible, we take all that it has to say, and when we read the Gospels, we know what came before it. So we come to it with the understanding of what came before. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're going to make up silly arguments like Jesus, you know, didn't speak against it, so homosexuality must be okay. All right, any questions on that before we move on? Okay, simple enough. Jesus was not okay with this sin. Okay. Seven ways the church has failed homosexual, homosexuals, failed to love homosexuals. This is a great book written by Tim Bailey uh, and others. His son was one of the co-authors as well. Um, very, very helpful, helpful book. And let's walk through, let's walk through some of the things that he brings up in this book. The first thing, the first error, he says, uh, that where the church has failed is this. Removing the sin of effeminacy. Effemin effeminacy. Effeminacy. Did I say it right? It's a hard word. It's a hard word. Say it backwards. Notice um, in 1 Corinthians 6, some translations, and this can, I'm not going to bog you down with this stuff, but it's very interesting. Uh, there's two words that Paul utilizes in Ephesians, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which we read at the beginning. Um, Malachor and arsenicoites. And Malachor uh, is often translated as soft, um, effeminate, you know, in modern young person language or, you know, guy, meathead, workout language, you know, wussies, you know, wimps, that sort of thing. Softy, say it. Pansy. Pansy, you know, softies. Gir girly, girly men, say, yeah, girly men, um, that sort of thing. So um, that word is utilized, malakoi, effeminate. And also another word, arsenicoites, which takes, which is interestingly the best, it's a, it, you can't find the word utilized in the ancient world. So scholars sometimes come to and say, Paul just made up a word, what's going on here? Well, when you look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and you go to Leviticus chapter 18, Okay, Greek translation of the Old Testament, go to Leviticus chapter 18. There's two words utilized there um, in, the, in the section which says a male shall not lie with the males with a woman. That's an abomination, right? In that text, the two words that the Greek translation uses is arsenikoi and, or arsenos and koitain. Like man sleeping sexual intercourse. And Paul combines these words. It almost makes this new word. But obviously, he's referring to Leviticus chapter 18, arsenicoites. But translations don't disagree on that. Uh, any translation you're going to read, you're going to read homosexuality in this text. But notice some translations, like the ESV and others, say it, they combine malakoi with arsenicoites, and, and they just translate it as men who practice homosexuality, which is not necessarily a terrible way to translate it, but the truth of the matter is there's more going on there. Uh, there is effeminacy and homosexuality there in the text. So I think the NASB, the KJV, ASV, other translations get it better when they separate those two terms because they are two separate terms. Now, what mo some modern translations try to argue is that um, it's, it's most likely referring to the active partner in the homosexual act in sodomy and the passive partner. Effeminate, the effeminate partner, the girly man in the, in the relationship. And that, that's definitely sinful too and true. But effeminacy and softness is, is not just a sin if acted upon. You see, Paul says, someone who is effeminate will not enter the kingdom of, uh, of God. That's what is said there. Uh, so it's better when translations separate the two. So this is what Tim Bailey's arguing and he's saying, uh, we, we made a mistake by removing the sin of effeminacy. Effeminacy, he says this, effeminacy doesn't start when the effeminate man gets in bed with another man. Just as adultery doesn't start when the adulterer gets in bed with a woman other than his wife. You see, uh, sins don't just start at the act. They start before that. So why won't effeminate men enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, because soft men don't take initiative. They don't take responsibility. Think about it. Can a coward stand firm in the faith in the midst of a wicked generation? Well, probably not. Can a coward stand firm? 
Probably not. And by implication, as we're going to read here from 1 Peter 3, men are to be hard, gritty, not soft, um, and women are to be soft by implication. And li listen to what Peter says about this. Women should adorn themselves with the imperishable beauty. Like, well, let, let me read the, let me just read the passage as, as is for you. 1 Peter chapter 3, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are of her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So you see, softness is a glorious thing for a woman. Quiet, gentle. It's a glorious thing. And, and we all know this. When you go over to someone's house and the woman is being completely disrespectful to the man, it makes you uncomfortable, you know? She, she's loud speaking over him and just, you know, yelling at him or, you know, we, we all know this. It's hard to say because the outside culture, it sounds like we're, we're a bunch of bigots saying this out loud. But we all know this inwardly. That it's not a good thing when a woman's really hard and rough and when a man is really soft and cowardly. Yeah. As we all know this in our, in our heart of hearts. Um, Calvin, it, it, I mean, notice elsewhere where Paul says, act like men, be strong. Um, Calvin writes this, By effeminate, I understand those who, while they may not openly become prostitutes, nevertheless show how unchaste they are by the use of pandering words. By effeminate, bearing and dress and other means of attracting attention. Another way to translate Calvin on this is, By effeminate persons, I understand those who, although they do not openly abandon themselves to impurity, discover, nevertheless, their unchastity by blandishments of speech, by lightness of gesture and apparel and other allurements. This is Calvin's commentary in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Uh, so, all right, that's the first thing. You, you need to know men are not to be soft. They're not to be wussies. Man made men. As we talked about uh, last week, men are to be men. Women are to be women. God made us that way. And that doesn't mean people aren't complex. That doesn't mean, like myself, a guy can't like poetry. I've never been hunting. But, so don't, don't hear me say you have to be playing football to be a tough man. That's not the point. And pe people often say that or make that argument. Oh, you're saying they all have to play. No, no. You just can't be soft and a coward. You don't have to play football. You know, okay, come on. Although, I recommend it. It's kind of fun to tackle something. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so that's the first thing. We, we shouldn't remove the sin of effeminacy. Men should be men, women should be women. And people are complex, and we take that into account. There's different types of people, um, but, but that needs to be in place. God made you who you are as a man or a woman. You should, you should be comfortable in that and work towards growing in that calling. As we talked about last week, gender, social, your social role is a calling. Um, all right, the next thing, and I spent extra time on that because I think that's the most controversial section. Um, the gay Christian error, the gay Christian error. Can you imagine me saying, I'm a drug addict Christian? I'm a drug addict Christian. Because I could say that. And it's the same, because I was a drug addict. Right? So it's the same thing. It's the same thing as, as many are trying to say today. I'm a gay Christian. It's like, hmm. Um, homosexual desire, here's what's important, is, is just as evil, or it's, it's evil, as well as the action which make, Paul makes clear in Romans chapter 1. The desire is evil. It's an evil desire. Remember, and remember, inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument, which I mentioned um, in one of the weeks of this class. It's the sign of a failed argument. So when people start using phrases they wouldn't use for other sins, there is an issue. There's inconsistency there. The Bible speaks about incest, bestiality, under the same heading of abomination in Leviticus 18, just like homosexuality. 
But can you imagine someone saying, I'm an incest Christian? No. So why are we inconsistent? Because we bought into the world's lie that you were born, you were born gay and there's nothing you can do about it. It's a moral, it's not a moral decision, and you gotta live with it. Even if it is true, just like with alcoholics, that there seems to be some sort of genetic disposition to alcoholism, um, although I don't like the term alcoholism, which is another class, but um, I, there, is some, there seems to be some sort of genetic disposition to being a drunkard. That doesn't mean drunkenness is good. That doesn't mean you can assume from the get-go that you have no moral culpability. You're morally responsible for the things you do with anything. So calling yourself a gay Christian, that, that, that is an error from the get-go because you're taking upon yourself a worldview that isn't biblical. That's not how the Bible would talk about these things. All right. The godliness is not heterosexuality. Have you ever heard that? Godliness is not heterosexual. The Gospel Coalition uh, put out something on this a while back. Uh, so this is a popular this is a popular statement these days, and I would see it as an error. I think it's kind of particularly silly uh, because although heterosexual people do sin, that doesn't mean that God's plan for mankind isn't heterosexual. It is. That's the way He ordered the world. Um, and, and furthermore, the, there's a hidden assumption here from the jump. And it's that, like we spoke about before, you're born with this a disposition, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not a choice. Uh, that's assumed when you say something like, godliness is not heterosexual. And it, especially when, in fact, the only way to be in a sexual union that is godly is a heterosexual union in marriage. Doesn't mean everything heterosexuals do isn't sinful. But the only option for a sexual union is a heterosexual one. One man, one woman in marriage. Uh, so that's an error. Uh, the sexual orientation error, which is related. There are two sexual identities in scripture, in scripture, male and female, as we talked about last week. And simply because human beings are complex, which they are, it doesn't change the fact that there are two. There isn't a third option. There isn't male, female, and something else. There's male and female. If you're a male, you're called to be how God made you to be as a male, and if you're a female, you're, you're called to that. If you're called to celibacy, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that's a third option. You're, you're still called to be a man, you're just, like Paul, not called to get married. Uh, you would, what Jesus would call, a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So when you're celibate, um, who could focus more on serving the Lord than earth, being distracted by earthly family matters. Um, so sexual orientation. That phrase, that, having that as an assumption is an error. The reparative therapy error, you know, this has gone under attack. There's been a, a lot of pressure on the church uh, to uh, turn against this idea. Um, basically, it's this, that when young people are struggling with same-sex attraction, uh, they should not be allowed to get counseling about it. Because it's like black-white. It's gay is the new black. It's like, you, you can't get counseling for your whiteness when you want to be black or black, you know, etc. So it, they would view it in a, in a very similar way. Uh, Pastor Tim Bailey says this about it. He says, the reparative therapy, conversion therapy, or orientation therapy, which is being criminalized around the country, is any counseling that helps men and women, boys and girls, who claim a homosexual orientation to embrace their heterosexual manhood or womanhood. It's that simple. That's what they don't want. They don't want you to have this therapy that helps you live in such a way as to be pleasing to God. It doesn't mean that all reparative therapy has been done right. For, you know, nothing's ever done perfect. Um, but throwing the whole thing out is, is very, very dangerous. So if, if, uh, if I have a son who grows up to struggle with these things, I, in some places, wouldn't be able to take him to get counseling for it. Um, if it was a difficult thing. So... That's not good. So we got to get rid of that. Reparative therapy or going to a counselor because you're struggling with something that you know is sinful. Um, that being bad, we got to throw that idea out. That's a good thing. You're struggling with something, you can go to a counselor. It's not that big of a deal. All right. uh, it it yeah. also goes to the, uh, against the thought that uh, you're biologically made that way. Mm -hmm. It's genetic. Exactly. And so it just, it, 
disagrees with that completely. Mm -hmm. that you can be right. repaired. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and when they're given examples of, of many people, there's a, a, have you ever heard of Rosario Butterfield? Mm -hmm. heard of her? Yes, yes. Um, she's married to a PCA pastor. Uh, I think PCA pastor, maybe RPCNA pastor, Presbyterian pastor in, in some good, decent denomination. And um, she was a lesbian English professor uh, in a long-lasting uh, relationship with another woman. Um, uh, through uh, the ministry of a PCA pastor, came to the Lord um, and ended up getting married down the line. And she's written books on it. Anything she's ever written on this subject, I recommend. So she's a go-to. Um, and when you bring people up like her uh, to people on the other side, it's, oh, you brush that under. That can't happen. She wasn't really homosexual. She wasn't really, yeah. 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 And, yeah. She was boycotted when she spoke in the camps of the USF. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people came out against her. At the time, uh, Jeff Lee was the um, camp's pastor, and he had her speak there. Mm -hmm. And it brought a lot of people out against her. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, they the yeah. down inside. The yeah, it's sad. Uh, it's very sad. Um, but she's very, very helpful for any of these issues. Uh, so. Recommend her. Uh, the such are some of you error. And, and notice all of these have a similar theme. Um, notice when Paul says effeminate nor homosexuals shown to the kingdom. And he says such were some of you. Um, it's as if today people are arguing such are some of you. You are a homosexual. You should be celibate. But you are a homosexual. That is what you are. And so you should, um, as we're going to see in the next era, live that out. They would, you know, this is the once a homosexual, always a homosexual error, once again, which is not the case. And sleeping with a man is a sin, okay? This is the way we should look at it. Sleeping with a man is a sin. Desiring to sleep with a man as a man is a sin, or a vice versa, or a woman with a woman. Um, that's a sin. And just like any sin, by the power of the Spirit, you can stop. And just like any sin, by the power of the Spirit, you can stop desiring it. No one said it's going to be easy. You know, that's, the, that's, the thing, that's the thing here. Um, you know, by making this some sort of biological thing, they try to make themselves as something different to any other sin. But the fact is, this is just a regular Christian life. We all have our propensities and, and, and sinful desires, and we all have to put them to death. I don't care what it is. Um, you know, drug addiction, you know, this is probably the best analogy I've come up with, but drug addiction and al alcohol uh, drunkenness runs in my, I mean, it's just everyone. It's just everyone had that, you know. Um, but I made a choice by the Spirit and stopped, you know. And I don't desire to go and snort cocaine anymore by the Spirit, you know. Um, and so there, there's, there's no... It's obvious, biblically speaking, that this is just another sin. It's a bad sin, but it's another sin that you can stop by the Spirit's help, just like, any, just like anything else. And, and Jesus didn't promise mortification of the flesh is going to be easy. It's never promised anywhere. It's always hard. All right, living out. And then we've got to close. Um, and by the way, I, uh, I begged on my knees to Pastor Bob to give me another week because I had too much uh, information <laughs> and stuff to teach. So I have one more week next week, and that's why we're not dealing with the pastoral concerns. Next week is all pastoral concerns. So bring your questions. If you have a question, okay, I have this situation. How, how do you think we should deal with this? And we could discuss as a class. So next, next week is all that. All right, last error. The living out error. Some argue um, not to be afraid of being a gay Christian, they would say. Don't be afraid of it. Be celibate. But be gay. Express your gayness. Um, um, there's, there's even a, an organization uh, that pairs people up, so to speak, uh, and, and tells them that they can live with one another, be celibate, but they can hold hands and have companionship as two uh, gay men. And say, we're gay Christians. We're celibate. We don't have sex. But we're gay Christians. And we're living that out. And that's one of the reasons why, why main, uh, uh, retaining the word effeminate in 1 Corinthians 6 is important. Because that is what Paul says. Uh, so it's not just a sin if they're not, in, in, it's not just a sin to, for them to be sleeping with one another. It's also a sin for these gay men to be gay and be soft and effeminate, running around holding hands with one another. That's sinful as well. And also, 
completely ridiculous. Would you ever tell your young daughter to go move in with another guy and just don't have sex? <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing ever. So, but that's what's going on. That's the living out. That's the living out error. You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, you know it's. It, it, and, and again, hopefully the one thing you really notice is how inconsistent um, the arguments can be. Um, it, and and I re that's what I really wanted you to see is that, um, is to see that if, if you can't apply what they're saying about homosexuality to other sins and say the same things about the other sins, there's a problem and it's a sign of a failed argument. Um, you, should, you should be able, and, and this is why we should use terms like sodomy. It doesn't mean you hate someone to use the term. It doesn't mean you hate someone when you use the term drunkard. You know, it, it, you're called to love your neighbor regardless of what they are. A sodomite, a drunkard, a pagan, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just, just, but use the real term or a term that emphasizes the sinfulness of it. It doesn't have to be that term. If there's another term, you can use that. Uh, but it is good to use the term, those, those types of terms because we care about people and we want them to turn to Jesus. Um, and this is, the name of that book by Tim Bailey is The Grace of Shame. The Grace of Shame. If someone doesn't feel shame for their sin before God, it's going to be pretty hard for them to repent and turn to Jesus. If I didn't feel shame for my uh, crazy lifestyle and drug addict behavior, um, why would I have turned to Jesus? Um, I needed to realize I was I was a drunkard. I was an I was a I was an outcast. I I was disgusting in God's sight, and so do other people. So they can turn to Him for uh, for grace. Uh, so shame is not a bad thing. The Holy Spirit uses shame in in the lives of of God's people. Um, so uh, that's why um, that's how we should approach it. And not be scared to use terms like that, not be scared to speak the truth very clearly. But we'll talk more about that next week as we discuss different pastoral concerns.